Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid, a podcast that explores the glorious mess of building your own business with the people doing it. I'm your host and fellow business builder, Kim Curtin. Thank you for being here. Let's get into some good, honest small business chat. Hello, listener. I am going to lift the lid a little on the podcast magic here by telling you that I try to record these episodes for you fairly far in advance. So to ensure that I can, in fact, deliver you a fresh business building story every single week. That is until I fall asleep at my keyboard preparing them and have a week or two off very occasionally, but it is how it's done. So that gives you context to me saying that I have been hanging out to bring you this episode for so long now. Our guest is the glorious and highly entertaining Jazz, and she is so generous with how she runs her business, from what she teaches others to what she shares here. And I am just so obsessed with how openly we can talk about getting paid better in the work we put out there. A lot of this chat is about money and charging, and it's hyper relative to anyone in the freelancing or consulting space, but is still super relevant to whatever your product is in your business and our all round money mindset. This week's episode, this week's business building story is in two parts for you so that you can make sure to get all the info in you need in a way that fits when and how you want to listen in. So in this episode, in part one, you'll hear about feeling uninspired by the traditional path that's come before, making a safe exit into entrepreneurship, the hesitation we experience when stepping into the role of teacher, the benefit of teaching from your experience over facts, and the myriad of ways we can charge for our services to make what we're worth. Let's get into the chat. I'm here with Jasmine Paris Ram, aka Jasmine Designs, aka the Pricing Queen, aka Jazz. For the last 15 years, Jazz has been serving Michelin star designs on a gold platter, solving her clients' problems and helping them grow their businesses as a graphic designer, muralist, lettering artist, website genius, and all-round business guru who's helped hundreds of clients achieve their business goals. While she's still a design superwoman to said clients herself, Jazz also shares her wisdom with her fellow freelancers with her The Pricing Queen title. For the last four years, Jazz has been mentoring her freelance students in all things pricing, giving them tools they need to confidently calculate and charge what they're worth. Jazz now also owns the Creative Business Kitchen, a business providing freelance creatives with all the tools they need for success. Inside Jazz's kitchen, freelancers can find help with undercharging, business processes, pricing with confidence, calculating rates, firing clients, finding hungry clients, raising rates, discounting, marketing, networking, and a whole pantry full of much more. From free downloads to affordable resources, masterclasses, and one-on-one help, Jazz has a solution to every freelance problem. She is the real-life six-figure freelancer with a taste for food puns, and I do love a pun, a wealth of secret recipes, and a practical approach to teaching. The pricing queen herself, Jazz, welcome to Unemployed and Afraid. Thank you so much for having me. I have to say one of the best investments I ever made was to get my copywriter to write my bio because every time I listen to it, I'm like, oh, she sounds interesting. Oh, wait, it's me. Hi. <laughs> I can absolutely back this in and this can be one of our first lessons for, for wonderful people if you haven't already done this for yourself and if it's available to you. It is such a benefit to get a creative copywriter eye over things. I receive a number of bios and a number of pieces of information in order to prepare for these interviews. And this is one where I was like, oh, cool, like copy, paste, add a few Kimisms in here and we're good to go. And usually I'm starting sort of from scratch and writing that up. So like the benefit of hiring somebody to get you creatively written up is so huge. I did it for this podcast as well. I had my blurb written by an incredible copywriter I love. Her name is Holly. And it's just made such a difference to my confidence in terms of like, oh yes, this is how it presents. Like, oh, that's how that sounds. Cause it's like, it's outside of me for a moment, you know? So I hear that. Yeah. It's like, you know, going and getting a Coles mud cake, but then adding your own stuff to the top. It's just like, okay, cool. This is like, even in its base level, it's delicious. It's a good like exact representation of what I'm wanting to create and give that first impression. But here, I'm going to put a couple of strawberries on it just to be fancy. And here we are with the food references and I am here for it. <laughs> oh, I cannot help it. Cannot help it. It's it's become 
not only part of my brand, but just part of the way I talk and understand everything that goes around me, but also how I understand and articulate a lot of the freelance experience. I mean, it's just a brilliant reference and I love it. So keep them coming, keep serving them up to me. But before we do, I know I couldn't help it. Before we do, I'd love to know a little bit about you personally through your best friend. How would your best friend describe you? I'm so glad that this was the choice because I did hear an earlier episode, which was how would your dog describe you? And then I was like, oh my God, what if she asks how my dog describes me? That's completely different to how Ellen describes me. So Ellen is my best friend, best friend in the world. And let's be honest here, my husband is my best friend, but Ellen's my best girlfriend. And Ellen and I have always had this thing of best work, best work. And that doesn't mean that it is the best of all options, but it means that it's the best that we can do. So we do our best work and it's always going to be the best version of ourselves and work, knowing that work is actually a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's not a negative. It's not a deficit. Work should be enjoyable. Work should be something that you create, that you're proud of. So Ellen and I would describe each other as best work. And we even have t-shirts that say best work, Barnold, which is because we believe that Barney, the purple dinosaur's full name is Barnold. So (laughs) it's this little like insignia that we have on these shirts, which says best work, Barnold. So yeah, she would name me as best work and I her too. I am such a big fan of like the random things that people come up with in their personal relationships, like the words for things, the secret languages, just the things that only you two would get. There's a lot here that I described in your bio in terms of you doing your best work, but before your two, maybe three pronged design and freelance supporting business offerings, who were you? Gosh, depends on how far you go back. The me that is now is a 33, I think I'm 33, I might be 34, who knows, 33 or 34 year old millennial eldest daughter, people pleasing recovery a woman who gets to do whatever the hell she pleases each and every day. My joy comes from creating something that didn't exist yesterday that helps someone tomorrow. And sometimes that's me and sometimes that's someone else. That's always kind of how I've grown up. So growing up, I am the daughter of small business. My dad owns butcher shops in Adelaide and my mum always either had her own small business or helped in in the small business that is the butcher shop. And so before all of the freelance, before all of the design, I was just someone that wanted to create things in any way, shape or form, whatever that meant. I believe that I was born with that innate ability to search for problems to solve because it meant that I was doing something. I was like, you can't create a solution that has existed before because otherwise the problem wouldn't exist. And I love that idea that we can be constantly creating, whether it be something physical, whether it be a idea, whatever that creativity form takes as the vehicle to get us to that solution faster or more enjoyably, that's kind of always been my my driving force. So I, throughout high school, I was always the girl who was in the design labs and my design teacher was like, I'd like to go home and see my family. Can you please leave? So I was always that overachiever as well, always giving 110%, always doing the the extra mile, even if it meant I wasn't wearing shoes for the extra mile, always trying to make sure that I over-delivered. And so I got to a point where I was doing that and doing that and doing that, but my salary wasn't showing that, that reward, that point where I had gotten to that, I'm doing everything for everyone, but I'm at the bottom of that list and it needed to change. And that's when I started freelancing. And so the last eight years have been freelancing for myself, but being able to enjoy the differences of all my different clients and then the last three years have been switching gears just a little bit to include freelancers in that service offering of being able to help other freelancers do the same thing that I've done but in a better way without having to have been caught up in all of the lessons that I definitely had to learn to get to be where I am today now. 
Take me back to the jazz who stepped out as a freelance designer for the first time. So the jazz making, first of all, the decision to do that. And then the first kind of few moments, weeks, you know, the reality of, of stepping out on your own. What was that experience like for you? So I was blessed with a bit of a safety blanket that was a year working part-time as a graphic designer. So I remember I found myself in this studio in Melbourne, which is no longer existing. Thank God for that. That it was just the the personification of a toxic work environment. And I'd gotten to the point where I was not happy in so many ways that I was recording conversations because I felt like they would be held against me. I was feeling sick on the train or the tram going to work. I was just not happy doing what I was doing. And the idea that this could extend further than just the couple of hours in front of me or days in the week or weeks in the month just made my stomach turn, was not where I wanted to be. And so I was given an opportunity. I was I was a creative recruit at the time as well. So I would do other freelance jobs and I was in touch with my recruiter and I actually had two recruiters at the same business reach out to me and say, hey, we've got a role for you. And one of them was for a senior designer in a really well-renowned studio who was interested in meeting me. And the the hours were going to be, you need to be there for an 8 a.m. meeting. And you were probably going to be there till five, maybe sometimes six, maybe sometimes seven. It was, you know, what you needed to do. And you would eventually climb through the ranks and become, you know, art director or get to a to those you know, next career levels. And this was an exact blueprint of what I believed I wanted to do when I was studying, when I was back in TAFE doing my advanced diploma in graphic design. And I was like, this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go through the ranks, be part of an agency, make your way through, get to that, you know, art director standard. And that's what you're supposed to do. And then eventually you would go out on your own and you make your own studio. And and I had this whole thing planned out. And the other option was a three day a week design job, which was processing like 150 ads for Rolex Australia. And that's the one I took because I knew that on the other side of that, on the other side of that job, because it was a maternity cover, one year, very specific, on the other side of that was freelance. And on the other side of that was the opportunity to go, I'm now a freelancer. I'm now trying to do things my way, the way that I want to do them. And the thing that I was missing so much as a designer in an agency, in a studio, is that I didn't get to connect with clients. And I know that clients get a bad rap when it comes to freelancing or or when we're working with clients, they do tend to be complex and difficult at times and frustrating at times, but there is something so frustrating about not having that connection with a client because you are only getting half of the problem to solve. And I felt like I was constantly finding myself not being able to solve all of the problem with all of my creative genius. And what I was able to do with that maternity leave cover, because it was only three days a week, I could work on my freelance design business on those other two days which let's be honest, it was those other four days because I was really concentrating on how can I make this work for me, not just for the next year, but for the year after and the year after. And when I looked at those futures, I knew exactly which one I wanted to do. And that was to become a freelancer and to get to that next stage where I was working with clients, solving their problems, being that design superwoman, that fly in, fix problems, fly away until you need me again person and actually enjoy the creative process and the creative problem solving process. I really love the way that you just described kind of finding your own certainty. And I think that's the big difference between choosing a corporate route, which is more than fine. Like fine's not the right word. It's fantastic Mm. if that feels right for you. But what I notice about that sort of corporate 
structure of you do this, you do this, you go to this strung of the ladder and, and then you end up here. If somebody else has kind of shown the way and placed the ladder rungs there for you. And mm. so then making the choice to go and figure out your own ladder rungs, like your own path, sometimes just that unknown of what it could and should look like is the thing that stands in the way of people making the choice. It's kind of like, you know, I here I can see it and our brains so naturally want that that almost that comfort not comfort's the wrong word this mm. just that knowing just that seeing you know we can we can get to the solution we can see the solution here but then having to craft our own solution can be such a barrier for so many of us with lives being so full and, and thinking about what you know is going to come next and, and all of the relative unknowns in that so what I really like about your story and your sharing there is you found a middle ground and you found a way to give yourself a deadline so you knew at the end of that contract, okay, it's going to be freelance time. And I mean, Lord knows, I mean, if you're a listener is anything like me, and I feel like you are too, Jazz, girl with the deadline is like on the hustle. Like I need a deadline to make things yes. happen. <laughs> and it, even if I have a two-week runway, it's like it's happening in the last two days because that's that's deadline. Don't give me more time than I need. <laughs> Please do not. We will both be disappointed. <laughs> exactly. And it will be an awful experience. But, you know, you gave yourself that that deadline and you gave yourself enough of a net to feel safe enough to explore that, which is, you know, an approach I think we don't often enough like allow ourselves to even see. It's like one or the other. I'm going all in on freelancing or I'm going all in on um, the corporate structure. But no, there, there can be something in between. And then at the end of like that maternity cover, like I won't say that I jumped into freelancing and being like, hey, I've got this all sorted. I've got this all diet. I've done this part time for a year. I've got this sorted. Because the first thing that anyone, when you first start freelancing, trips up on is to make freelancing successful, I need to be making exactly as much as I did when I was employed. Uh, no. That's what we call ramen profitability. We want to have a ramen profitable approach to those first couple of years. So ramen profitability, and it's not just another food pun, it's actually a great moment where it all kind of kind of came together and I was like great something that makes sense from a business perspective and it's already fooded excellent done let me serve it so ramen profitability is the idea that you have enough coming in to cover your expenses to cover your running expenses as a business with enough to live on ramen at the end of the week and so understanding what your expenses are to begin that process is like the first like paramount moment where you have to go okay I know that I have expenses and I remember this first year I had a ramen profitable number of $600 a week I knew that my cost of business was $600 a week including everything that I needed to cover so as long as I covered that that was success that was that level of success that's kind of where that rung is so that's that first rung of success as long as I'm covering that then I'm fine and then I could start building. I can't go straight from zero to, what was I on? $70,000 $70, a year. I can't go from zero to 70 grand just starting out. It's kind of unrealistic. I wish it was realistic, but it's kind of unrealistic. And the more that we set ourselves up for that, the more we're setting ourselves up for failure. And if we're setting ourselves up for failure and then being disappointed when we meet it, then something's wrong with our planning. This is incredible advice and I, I have a two-part question, which is did you know that that was the approach that you needed to take when you got started or is that something that you figured out along the way? That's the first part of my question. Hindsight is a wonderful, wonderful thing. <laughs> it's kind of like that whole when uh, you watch a movie and then you watch it again knowing how it ends. Mm -hmm. Back then it I knew parts of it, but I didn't have the full picture. I had the edge pieces of the puzzle, but I did not have the full picture whatsoever. I'm, I'm really pleased to hear you speak like that because, yeah, this is the thing. Like, so much of it is in hindsight and retrospect and it's back to that, you know, those barriers that make us stop even getting going in the first place is because there is so much that we don't know, but there is just that measure of figuring it out along the way. And, and financially, that's probably one of the most important journeys. It is reframing your experience with money, what you need versus what you want, what's possible. And then also learning the business surprises along the way. Like I will never forget that first moment when I have a company structure now as opposed to a sole trader structure that I had originally. 
And then the first time when I realized I drew a salary that I also then had to pay myself super, I was like, well, shit, girl didn't budget for that, did she? Like, <laughs> these are things that you learn on the way and they sound small, they sound insignificant, but you budget for something and then you go, oh no, I actually need to have additional on top of that. Yeah, new levels, new devils. It definitely is a situation of like new levels, new devils. You find the things that you're like, oh, that wasn't a problem for past me because this past me hadn't reached this level. I definitely feel the exact feeling of you're like, oh, I didn't budget for my own super. This is not a problem I've had before because I wasn't a company before. Actually, it's currently, you know, spoiling the fourth wall or whatever it is, but it's currently the 26th of March, which means next week, Jazz has been a company for a year. And it was a very weird moment that I had to kind of get my head around of like, a company can still be a company of one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's actually for other reasons. It's the company structure sometimes is not just for being a company so that you can hire other people. And I don't know, whenever I think of a company, I think you've gone and gotten a whole heap of desks and you've rented a space and you've like got people under you. And for some reason you've got like vehicles and like all of this stuff. No, a, a company can be a company of one if it is for different reasons and mine's tax reasons. No one needs to be paying that much tax if there's a better way to do it. Amen. And don't get me started about business credit cards and all those sorts of wonderful <laughs> things because I've been begging on yeah, about Yeah, no, this. I've seen your story today. <laughs> you're, you're, I believe that we're calling you uh, Kim Curtin Points Gal uh, yes, from now on. Yes, yes. And my, my partner, <laughs> uh, COO slash Points Hacker uh, 101. But I'm really pleased to hear though that you, you had that that process and, and that ability to go through and go, oh, okay, no, I'm learning this and now I can see that I'm learning that and now I can see that, which makes me imagine a little bit like, as you're setting up your freelance design structure and as things are going along and the inkling to develop what essentially would become your second business offering in the creative business kitchen probably came from some of those surprises and those learnings and that I can give something back here. But I don't want to take that story away from you and out of your mouth. Please tell me the story of developing that and how that was birthed from your freelance structure. I believe that the best teachers are only two steps in front of you. I don't believe that those who are the experts completely, who have mastered everything, who have got it all dialed in, are the best teachers. You only need to be one to two steps ahead of someone to throw the hand back and bring them forward. And that's kind of where I was. I knew enough to be enough for the freelancer that I was a year before or two years before or three years before because I knew that was what I was good at. I was good at solving my own problems. And if those problems were replicated in other people, then great, cool. Let me show you how I solved it. That was actually a little bit of a hurdle that I had to get over of, you know, that any educator or anyone who has taught someone else something has always had that, oh, but why would you learn from me? I don't have it mastered or I don't have it dialed. What if I say the wrong thing? What if I spout a fact that's not true? And that's where I highly recommend teaching from experiences. Don't teach from fact. Don't teach from the, the fact that someone taught you that this is the way that things go and therefore you teach that because someone taught you. No, teach from experiences because it means that it's more authentic and you can't be wrong when it's your experience. You cannot be wrong. And so that's what I ended up starting off with. I had one of my wonderful dear friends who still to this day comes to me for pricing advice, slide into my DMs and say, hey, I'm trying to price this. I don't know how to, can you help me? And after a I won't even count how many voice notes back and forth of like, but what if we do this? Okay, what about that? What if we do this? What if we do that? And it was just the fact that I was, that I knew enough to be enough what he needed in the moment sparked off that idea of like, well, what if, what if this was more? What if this was something that we could do, that I could do, that I could create? Because I know enough to give back. My dad has always brought me up on the idea that you need to be big enough to serve someone but small enough to know them. And so that was something that was really, really important to me that to be able to know the problem is to know the solution. So I needed to be able to get really good at understanding what problems that other people were having so that I could help them solve it. From that, I then had more and more of those kind of interactions of like, 
how do I price this? How do I do this? And I surprised myself with how much I knew because by that point I had been full-time freelancing for around about five years, but I had been in so many different businesses. So part of my freelancing journey included being a creative recruit and going into different businesses and just having to jump in, get hands dirty on the fly, find out what the core problem is, find out the best way to solve it and get the stuff done, just get it done. And that opened me up to a lot of exposure for different ways that different businesses did business. And I started to realize that, hey, there's no one key way to do business. There's no like, okay, you do this and then you do that and then profit. It's not a Cards Against Humanity card. It's, you know, you create your own kind of process for how you want to do business. And I had always believed that freelancers can only do an hourly rate that they then swap for time and then they build from there. And the only way that they can make more money is to increase their rate. That's great for the first couple of years because you are developing a knowledge of how fast you can get solutions served and how much they cost you in a time currency. And then there's the other added elements of like an energy element, particular clients who, you know, you don't budget for 40 back and forth emails. You don't do that because they might surprise you and only do 30. But you then find yourself in this position where you are more valuable to the client than the the price that you're putting on your time, effort, and energy. And you can't, there's, there's only so many rate raise increases that you can do before people look at your rate and laugh. So you need to start doing a better job or being more creative in the way that you serve that. And that's when I started to do my own research of, okay, I've always known that there's hourly rates. I've dabbled in project pricing and that's kind of how I do it a lot. There must be others. And I took it upon myself to try and find out those answers and build that kind of buffet of different ways to price so that I could be that one or two steps ahead of whoever was asking me the question, how the fuck do I price this? I really love that advice because, yes, I think so often we look to take our guidance from where we are, from those who are over the mountain. And now, of course, you and I have had the pleasure of a number of um, wonderful conversations prior to this one in which we have tangented all the way around and back again. But I know how much you understand the premise of this podcast, which is that when we only hear from people who have completely done the thing and are on the other side of the mountain, we don't learn enough. We don't see ourselves enough. We give up. You know, we always go for those books that are, oh, let me hear about this great experience of this amazing person who's done all these incredible things. And it's like, yes, that is aspirational for a moment, but it's really inspirational to where we are because we struggle to see the potential of ourselves in that because it may be a little bit too far forward, but not to say that we can't get there, but it's, you know, maybe a little bit too far forward. So, you know, looking to those who are only just a few steps further ahead and the generosity of those people also and sometimes even seeing the reflection of those who are two steps behind to allow us to have the benefit of hindsight outside of our own minds is is such a benefit it's exactly why you know exactly the thing that I use in this podcast which is like let's just get a plethora of people who are at different phases so that we can see us in their stories to encourage ourselves to keep going but the way you just described that two steps ahead I think is excellent advice and hopefully confidence building for a lot of people out there in terms of sharing their own values value that they can provide as well and knowing that they have value. What also stood out to me that I would I would love just your thoughts and opinion on because I absolutely know I have a number of people who are, are working in freelance models, listening to this podcast, some who may be uh, pricing themselves in a service offering but aren't in a traditional freelance structure as well, who will benefit from this. But I saw something recently and they said something along the lines of, you should not be punished for the speed in which you can deliver something because that is experience. So I'll give you a real life example, which is myself. I am incredibly speedy at getting to a solution for a client who wants to be in the podcasting space and considering their concept and how it might ladder up to a cultural inside, a brand inside, a potential audience inside, all of those things. Sometimes I can do that in a matter of moments, but that's only because I've had 15 years of experience in audio content space. And so if I was to charge myself an hourly rate 
and only ever look at that hourly rate. But yet I can actually potentially deliver the thing in 15 minutes. You know, there's a punishment factor there for those people who can produce something quickly, but the quality is so there. So it's not necessarily a question. It's more to you, I'd love to hear your opinion on that and that challenge that we have in pricing ourselves by time blocks versus what we can deliver. Yeah, I believe it was a a story that I heard in my TAFE days and anyone who is listening to this. And if I biff this up, let me know because I will gladly accept it. Don't worry, you're in good company. I stuff up metaphors and analogies (laughs) constantly. So you're good. Don't worry. No judgment. But I I believe it was Paula Scher that did the Citibank logo. And the Citibank logo was famous not because of what it looks like or how it's used, but how it was created and when it was created. The Citibank logo was created in the briefing meeting, written on a napkin whilst sitting there. And it, all it is, it's, it's, it's a beautiful logo. It's the C-I-T-I and then it looks like an umbrella mm-hmm. and you've got your cupboard. And upon presenting that, upon seeing, the, the client saw that that was basically the logo and he, she's like, they were like, but it took you 30 seconds to come up with that. And the response was, but it took me 30 years to learn how to come up with that in 30 seconds. And I feel like the, there's so many times where we apply a discount code unnecessarily to the value that we deliver to our clients. Now, whether that be, oh, but I got it done really quickly. That's a value. Oh, but I I enjoy my job. Why should I be charging someone for it? That's a value. Oh, but it was something that I've done before. That's a value. A lot of the time that we are applying these discount codes because we feel it will avoid the conflict of being told that we're too expensive and us believing it. But at the end of the day, being told you're too expensive is an opinion, not a fact. And people will love to have opinions. What's the saying? Opinions are a bit like assholes, but... <laughs> <laughs> Into that. Um, thank you for that. that. I think that could be a yeah, really helpful takeaway to people who, who might be listening and thinking about how to value themselves and uh, that old argument of, of time versus skills or versus deliverables, which is really helpful. Hands up if you're going to start charging more effectively for the value that you bring to your customers, no matter where those customers come from, my hand is most certainly up. And let's head over to part two, where we get into the marketing juggle, the magic of a small following, navigating rejection, creating a better relationship to self when dealing with tough clients and defining success through your impact. So jump over to listen in now or bookmark for later and I'll see you there. P.S. Don't forget to leave the show a review or a star rating if you're loving it. I would love to hear from you.